Hello, it's Employee A Million, and welcome back to SpongeComs. Today's episodes make up Season 2, Episode 5, or Episode 25 overall, Wormy and Patty Hype, both of which originally aired on February 24th, 2001. And I am super happy that that's the last time I have to say February for quite a while, because that's very hard for me to pronounce. And for a long time, people thought that this was the first episode to air in 2001. That's been proven false, so I've always treated this a bit differently from the first couple Season 2 episodes, but we'll see how we see its information today. Wormy was written by Walt Dawn, Paul Tibbet, and Meriwether Williams, and the animation was directed by, this should be coming up, Andrew Overtoom, who I think was new to Spongebob at this time, Maybe he did some season one work. Oh, right, he was a sheet timer in season one, and then he went to animation direction in season two, and he stuck with the show for a good amount of time, I think until season eight, returning until 12. So he has his thumb in this pie, and this is a pretty delicious pie. It's a very funny episode. Pies were last week's news. This pioneered the pit-zitting genre of SpongeBob episodes, as well as the looking after Sandy's tree dome genre of Spongebob episodes. Both of these kind of diverged into their own different episodes in season H. Don't know exactly why. This one's good enough as it is. But yeah, this is a pretty fun episode. It's got a very interesting idea that I wish was explored more in Spongebob. They've got Spongebob and Patrick having to deal with this land mammal and understand how it works, and I think that throwing Sandy into the mix was a good way to introduce this. Because believe it or not, this is Sandy's first appearance in season two. She isn't in the first four episodes. And I think this might have to do with some, like, of the redesign work, because Sandy's design in season one is pretty different. She has a different badge, and her tail doesn't stick out of her... Um suit. Here they give her the acorn badge, which doesn't mean that she's nuts, as well as give her tail some room to roam free in the water. Don't know how it stays so dry though. And the song that's playing right now is That's What Friends Do by Chris Von Snyden. Sorry if I butchered that name, but yeah, it's a pretty fun song. Not often you get this sort of power ballad in Spongebob, Season 2 had a thing for that, sort of like retro 80s music. The 80s was only just becoming retro at the time. We'll see a lot more of it in Band Geeks, don't you worry. And yeah, I think it's fun. Unfortunately, it's cut out in some international versions. I can kind of get why, but... hmm. This opening to the episode is very wholesome. Spongebob and Patrick just having this great time, having this great time with this worm, and having one of their best days ever with a brand new friend who doesn't even say or do anything. They just have a new friend to play with, and that's apparently enough. And continuing on with the season two live action footage train, We've got this little bit with Wormy turning turning from a green caterpillar into a monarch caterpillar, which turns into a butterfly overnight. Now, I graduated preschool. I don't think butterflies metamorphosize overnight. So maybe Wormy's a science experiment for Sandy. But even then, why would she call him Wormy instead of caterpillary? Beats me, I guess. A fun thing about this horsefly close-up, which isn't exactly... isn't exactly the most wholesome part of the episode, but it's a recurring element, that isn't a butterfly, and that definitely isn't wormy, buddy. That is a horsefly. Don't know why they... I mean, I I get why they did it, to make it seem scarier to Spongebob and Patrick and eventually Squidward and Mr. Krabs. 
Apparently that footage is recycled from an episode of Bill Nye the Science Guy. Don't know exactly how valid that is, just saw it on the Spongebob wiki and thought someone might have been a bit more freaked out by it than I was. And it lasted with them longer in some way, shape or form because, yeah, that close up freaked out a lot of kids. To the point that in the airings that I watched, the buzzing was toned down especially, so it kind of just... I don't remember... It, I remember it being almost muted, like there's this, the buzzing sound effect is a lot softer, and I don't blame other countries for cutting the part out entirely, because <sighs> leaves an impact, and I am definitely not going to jump scare you with it. Or am I? So this is another fun part of the episode, Spongebob and Patrick trying to do all these things to get the butterfly. I like the thing with the phone, that's a bit of a subversive joke. And yeah, Spongebob and subversiveness works pretty well. And here begins or establishes constant confusion over Patrick's eye color. Sometimes it's green, sometimes it's brown. Sometimes it's purple, it's whatever the animator wants, depending on the day of the week. And look, it's never bothered me personally, I'm not some sort of green eyes ruined forever maniac, try and get that reference. But yeah, seems like an odd thing to discourage debate about, like whether or not Patrick has a nose. And I think that you start to see the animators and writers battle things out in this episode because some of the stuff in the tree dome doesn't make a lick of sense, like Spongebob blowing a bubble from his helmet. You get a lot more of that in episodes like Survival of the Idiots, where they have an intended idea, but it doesn't translate perfectly into the show, so... Either they ignore it, or a compromise is made. And another bit that probably caused some sort of miscommunication was the photo taken of Spongebob and Patrick bumping into Mr. Krabs just a while ago was much loonier in its original form, but it was toned down a bit for the final airing. Something you'll... I noticed about both these episodes, watching them back to back, is that when crying in both of them, Tom Kenny does the same, like, throat hitting thing as when he's laughing as Spongebob. Don't know why they're exclusive to these episodes. Maybe it's another thing that he tried to experiment with and it didn't work out so well. I mean, it's not my favorite way to see Spongebob cry, but... Uh, a little experiment couldn't hurt. And that, my friend, is the pose for one of those gimmick accounts of Mr. Krabs telling you what day of the week it is. Now, here's a part that kind of con would confuse me if they cut it out in my country, the horse flag close-up, because it would make almost no sense why Squidward and Mr. Krabs freak out if they and thereby the audience, don't see the close-up. As with a lot of even the best pre-movie episodes or the more mid-range pre-movie episodes, the ending does sort of colour exactly how I view the episode as it goes on. Not saying that Spongebob has never been good with its endings, but this is a full-on descent into chaos, and... It's mostly about the jokes rather than the story because it's just kind of absurd that everyone in town would be going nuts over a butterfly. I'm sure at least some of them would know what it is. I mean, there's a dog store right there. Maybe that's the Shell Shack, who knows? Bit more of a teaser for tomorrow's episode. Sorry, next episode. See, they show a picture of a butterfly here, well, a clip, and it still freaks this guy out. 
And Andrew Overton was pretty new to animation directing, so... Yeah. A lot of the, these shots in this climactic mob destroying Bikini Bottom are a little overambitious, and sometimes characters look off or they use the wrong color for something or they forget to color something in. Like the very last shot of Sandy being carried by the crowd, there's like one animation error every five frames, and it's really funny and it's hardly noticeable. But yeah, it makes the ending feel a bit more rushed. Like, this is an inherently interesting concept, Spongebob and Patrick having to deal with a creature from up on land that isn't Sandy, and they go to a very interesting place with it, and I'm happy with how it goes, but, hmm. They do do it later on with stuff like chimps and Sandy's nutty nieces, but yeah. Also, that is some heavy artifacting on that bus, not to mention there was some artifacting on Wormy earlier on, so yeah, probably one of those episodes that you shouldn't really watch too much on an HGTV. Keep your old CRT around for episodes like this, I'm saying. But overall, I enjoy Set Wormy. It's a very funny episode, and I think that it's just a good time. It's hard to explain, but it's just a good time. Patty Hype was written by Jay Linda, Bill Reese, and Mr. Lawrence. And I've got a little fan theory about this one. So sometime near the start of season two, like they were probably a bit into production by this point, um, Jay Linda was teaching a new recruit about storyboarding and stuff. And he went off on one about how he hates surprise party cliched stories where, say for instance, Spongebob doesn't know that people are doing a surprise party for him. It's his birthday and no one's around. He doesn't like that kind of story. So about a week after that, Steve gave him that episode idea as a commission and Jay just rejected it, so they made something else instead, and I think this was that episode, and I've got little bits of evidence here and there for that. For one thing, it's an episode very focused on color. You see a lot of color theory in this episode, the drabness of the Krusty Krab in the beginning, and some more eccentric color choices like this green Tom and person at the end with Mrs. Puff's color scheme, not to mention just all the stuff with the pretty patties. And the exact design for Spongebob here was used in some promos during the summer of 2000, namely the intro for the Spongebob Nicktoon Summer Splash, and for this Halloween promo where he's putting together a party. So I feel like this episode was produced in tangent with those advertisements, so you can kind of date the animation of this episode to around July 2000. It's just a fun little theory that I have. Don't know if it's concrete fact, but I mean, obviously the surprise party stuff is, that was a real episode idea that they had that Jay vetoed out of pure apathy for the trope. But these exact clues as to where Patty Hype was made within the context of season two's production, this is just my theories, don't take it as exact fact. Should really talk about the episode now because this is absolutely one of my favorite season two episodes. And I'd go even far as to call it top 10 material for the whole show. Love it that much. This is, in my opinion, the quintessential Spongebob and Mr. Krabs dynamic episode. It just goes over it so well. It goes over stuff about optimism, upstart businesses, and more cynical, cash-grabby mindsets between young blood and old blood. And it does that with the pretty patties, Spongebob, just wants to do something that'll catch people's attention, and Mr. Krabs 
doesn't really believe it, and he just capitalizes on it under the pretense that it'll make him money, and... Hmm. It's a very good idea. And it was executed very well. Like, this is probably a top-tier story for Spongebob. It's not too complicated, and it's not too simple. It escalates at a good enough rage. We've got this famous scene where Patrick cannot see his forehead. And the old inflatable pants bit doesn't hurt either. Another thing that really surprises me about this episode, and I'm probably looking too deep into this for a Spongebob episode, but it makes for a pretty good critique on food colouring, because food colouring has been around since Egyptian times, but modern, like, food dye and stuff often has chemicals with side effects and it depends on the company, it depends on the exact colour, and it depends on the consumer. Like, there was a rumour going around a while back that they caused ADHD-like symptoms and they were inconclusive. But yeah, it throws a big monkey wrench into this sort of Maybe Spongebob's using food colouring, and maybe that's causing the side effects. Don't know if food colouring actually makes people blue or green or purple, or kilt pattern coloured, played. If it did, that would be awesome. People would be using food colouring more. Want to... Want a Shrek cosplay? Just add green pretty patty. <laughs> So yeah, this is a really fun idea, and it's a bit deeper than I thought it was when I was a kid. Like, there is a lot of value in this episode that a lot of people don't really realize. I mean, of course, there's a lot of satire in episodes like Chocolate with Nuts and all that sort of episode. But this is kind of the progenitor to Chocolate with Nuts, and... It says something about a specific aspect of the food industry. And it does so pretty well. Also like how he reaches for the indigo pretty patty instead of the violet one. I guess it's kind of purple, but people sometimes point it out as an animation error. It doesn't really seem like one to me. I also really love the soap opera with the amoeba. This is like the fourth episode in a row to have live-action footage. That's strange. Another thing that makes this episode pretty memorable and is something that more people... <laughs> more people than me bring up is the memes about the stand. Like, there is the meme of Spongebob standing at the bubble stand from episode of the same name and putting up a thing, and the crowd goes from big to massive. Half of those are from Bubble Stand, and the other half are from Patty Hype. I hope that my delivery and stuff has gotten a lot better since my Bubble Stand sponge comms. And there is another meme later on of Mr. Krabs looking around disoriented when people are giving him what for, for the pretty patties and their side effects. I like that too. I mean, it's obviously of a different era of the sort of random access is something that's kind of funny, let's blow it into this big thing era of memes. But it has its uses. Absolutely adore this ending too of Spongebob just fanboying over the Krusty Krab. And Somehow they whittled it down to just being an episode about Spongebob and Mr. Krabs. Like, Squidward shows up for his jokes, then disappears. Patrick shows up for his jokes, then disappears. But Mr. Krabs does mention Squidward here, so... Pardon my alternate fandom interpretation, but... Maybe Spongebob's turning all these fish into pretty patties? <laughs> Let's not go into creepypasta material, goodness no. But again, I do really like the delivery of all these lines. This has got to be one of Spongebob's very cutest appearances. 
Like I went over last week in Dying for Pi that he has a very childlike demeanor. This one kind of goes with it. It just makes him like this precious little child who, who's visiting Disneyland and has the keys to it. Like Tom Kenny is a great actor and still is a great actor, but he doesn't often give SpongeBob this level of awe. And it's great when it comes out because everyone can relate to it. Everyone has their thing that they never want to leave and they just love. And oh my gosh, the music in this scene too just builds and makes you feel so good for SpongeBob. It's no wonder that they've only used this a few times, like only two or three times in the entire show. The only other time I can think of is in Pizza Delivery, where... Again, Spongebob's fawning over the rock, which Squidward mistakenly calls a boulder for some slapdash reason. Gosh, I love this scene. Love all the different laughs that they give Spongebob. And I also love how Spongebob didn't even bother to clean Mr. Krabs' office, but he did put in a drive through because... I think this is the first time we see anything resembling a drive through in Spongebob. I think this is also the last appearance of some incidental characters. Maybe, maybe not. This is definitely the first and last time we see that fella in the bottom left, his bottom right, who looks like Mrs. Puff. Maybe it was the result of an animation era. Maybe it was the result of a pretty patty. But... It's very soon overshadowed by the disorientation meme and what the Scotsman has under his guilt. And about this very ending joke of Spongebob squeezing the pickles together absolutely accentuates the cuteness, but I wonder if Spongebob having that sort of fondness for pickles is an allusion to another one of Tom Kenny's major roles that he was doing at the time the mayor of Townsville from the Powerpuff Girls, who loved his pickles in one season one episode, and then around the time the movie came out, they really doubled down on it. I mean, this was before the Powerpuff movie, but already I think that they were like, this is definitely the thing that the mayor shall be known for, aside from being a dunce. So that was Wormy and Patty Hype. My question of the week for you this week is, would you try a pretty patty? Ignoring that it might have poison in it, it might be made of squid and octopus and starfish. Would you try one for something like a costume or just for the heck of it? Like as one of those candies, those big gimmicky candies that changes something about you? Let me know. My question of the week for you last week was, what's your favorite emotional moment in the show? Mr. P says when Spongebob gives a handmade clarinet to Squidward in Christmas Who, and then he dresses up as Santa to make Spongebob happy. Super Seal and Cartman TV say Gary come home. Jack McGinn and Cartman Reviews say Spongebob drying up in the Spongebob movie. Ariel System also says Gary come home, and My Name's Not Rick says the Who Am I song from Mimic Madness. Ice Cream Hero, really love your passion and the effort you put into your comment, but I'll try to stick to ones that only have one answer. Sorry, bud, but thanks for your time. Next week, we have the social discord that appears in Grandma's Kisses and Squidville. Goodbye for now.